Hello again, um, and welcome to our third installment of the Global Impacts of COVID-19 webinar series. My name is Wendy Hunter Barker. I'm an assistant dean here at the School of Global Policy and Strategy at UC San Diego. Uh, many of you have been following our series, so for that I want to say thank you. Um, you've gotten to know a little bit about the school, uh, but for the uninitiated, let me take a moment to say something about GPS before introducing today's speakers. GPS was established in, oh, let me get my screen to work correctly. There we go. GPS was established in uh, 1986, and we're the only international affairs school in the UC system. We offer professional training to students interested in a wide variety of careers from public policy to traditional diplomacy, and to those also interested in data analytics in the pursuit of sustainable development for both the environment and for people and economies. We have four master's programs uh, and a number of other degree options. And our curriculum is analytically rigorous and multidisciplinary. All of our programs build upon the dynamic research of our faculty who are disciplinary explorers, always seeking answers to multifaceted complex problems by engaging in active collaboration across the UC San Diego campus, as well as beyond. GPS has 12 outstanding research centers and today's moderator, Rafael Fernandez de Castro, is the director of one of them, the Center for U.S.-Mexican Studies. So Rafael, let me hand this over to you and thank you for organizing today's webinar for us. Thank you, Wendy, for your initiative. It's a wonderful opportunity for the Center of U.S.-Mexican Studies to participate in this GPS series. Uh, and uh, thank you, uh, Dean Piracawa. You're always behind all of these initiatives. So thank you both uh, for, for having U.S. Max to become part of this series. Uh, we're going to talk about Mexico. Uh, today we're going to talk about COVID-19, how it has impacted Mexico. And, uh, and I invited this very distinguished panel. Uh, I will start by introducing Jaime Sepúlveda. Jaime Sepúlveda, he is uh, the di executive director of the UC San Francisco Institute for Global Health Sciences. He is a very well known, a renowned epidemiologist, and uh, he has won so many academic awards, and he has a very distinguished uh, public service. Uh, I met Jaime long ago, I was working there for President Calderon, and, 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 and since then on, we have been doing things together. Uh, Stefano Bertosi, he is the Dean Emeritus and, prof uh, and Professor of Health Policy at UC Berkeley. And now he acts as well as interim director of Alianza UC Mexico. Jaime and Stefano and me, we have put together this series of webinars, uh, uh, already five, uh, to discuss uh, US-Mexican relations of, under COVID-19. And we invite you all to join us. It's every Friday at nine o'clock uh, Pacific Standard Time. and. Uh, and we do this in Spanish because we want uh, to impact the debate in Mexico about COVID-19. And uh, finally, Viridiana Rios is with us. Thank you, Viridiana, for, for accepting our invitation. She is a scholar at, and, and visiting professor at Harvard University. She was, and I'm very proud of it, a former fellow of US Mex, and she's a wonderful Mexican political analyst. Jaime, why don't we start with you? We'll, we'll do about... Uh, health first and uh, and then we'll go about the economy please Jaime and thank you for accepting our invitation thank you so much um, I will take uh, 10 minutes to give a quick tour over um, this situation of uh, COVID in terms of origins in terms of expansion in terms of uh, the situation in the world in the US and Mexico and some um, quick recommendations so if I may share my screen now um, i will start by saying um okay can we have the next one i may if you go to the upper left corner of your screen and click on use slideshow we'll see it better okay so um let me start by saying that Pandemics have been with us for a long time, um, all the way back to the uh, Roman Empire. It was the cause of the fall of the Roman Empire in the plague of Justinian. And since then, there have been a number of pandemics that have affected large uh, 
segments of the population, including the um, 14th century Black Death or bubonic plague that uh, erased uh, up to one fourth of the European population. The Spanish flu, of course, uh, which is a wrong denomination, it was not um, originated in Spain, by the way, um, caused uh, about 50 million deaths. And now, of course, we're all aware with the current epidemic of HIV AIDS and uh, this novel coronavirus that uh, is going to be as bad as some of the previous uh, pandemics. And I may. Um, just a warning, this is not the last one. Jaime? Uh, yes. Um, if you go to the upper left corner of your screen and click Use Slideshow, we can see your slides much better. On the Notes screen, you don't see that Use Slideshow? No. Um, okay. Let me let me continue, if I may. Yeah. Um, so this is um, a timeline. It is amazing that just in four months since the first case of uh, this novel disease was um, reported, we have now more than 2.7 million people. Uh, affected close to 2,100 deaths. This is the fastest ever um, expanding pandemic in the history of uh, mankind. Um, how, why is it that this novel coronavirus is so bad? It's a, a combination of being a respiratory spread virus, highly contagious and also lethal. Um, you know it's uh, spread by droplets, but also by hands and contaminated surfaces. This is the um, couple of days ago picture of the hotspots, the epicenters. China started in December, then Europe in uh, end of January, February, and then the US is the largest uh, hotspot with one third of the cases and uh, um, many deaths as well and climbing. Um, this is the population density, the confirmed case per capita by geography. The East Coast much more affected, but areas that have a large proportion of Mexicans, like Michigan, um, in the case of uh, Chicago, uh, Houston, Miami, and Los Angeles are also sources of um, spread. This is some. Um, quick slide showing the difference of having early intervention. This is um, in Italy, in the region of uh, Lombardy, two adjacent um, provinces, Lodi and Bergamo. Lodi having started uh, interventions on the 26th of February, while Bergamo started much later, um, 10 days later. You can see that only in 10 days, the impact in two adjacent uh, regions is uh, striking. Same in uh, California. This is comparing sheltering in place in San Francisco and Los Angeles. And you can see that in San Francisco, we started shelter in place before there was any death reported, at least uh, a week before, while in LA, um, they started sheltering in place a week after, or 10 days actually after the first reported death. If we do the same with uh, New York. So these are examples that intervening early and aggressively is what makes a huge difference in the um, spread of the epidemic. In Mexico, this is um, a graph with the new cases reported in Mexico. Um, this, I am afraid, is a huge underestimate of the real number of cases. The reason being that very few tests per million people are being done as we will see shortly. So this is a map of um, the relative um, concentration of cases 
I think uh, Mexico is doing better now in terms of reporting. They have uh, information now at the municipal level, at the county level. So that is some progress, but still the information is scarce, late and incomplete. Uh, this is a map with the counties uh, or municipalities and how in Baja California, particularly in Tijuana, we have now one of the largest concentration of cases that is also true in Baja California Sur, Los Cabos, Quintana Roo, uh, touristic places in Mexico. These um, charts uh, reflect cases and uh, deaths in Mexico by sex and age, you will see that there is a predominance of males over females in the number of people that have uh, died. And we have to learn and understand better why. But also the fact that um, younger populations under 60 constitute the largest number of cases that have been um, infected and hospitalized. I was referring before that Mexico is one of the countries with the uh, smallest uh, proportion of tests per million population. Um, it's um, embarrassing that Guatemala, a much poorer country, is doing more testing than in Mexico. Only uh, Mexico is uh, above Honduras and Haiti in terms of number of uh, tests per million population. If you compare with, uh, I would call it the gold standard, Iceland, that has done um, a lot of testing, almost 10% of the Iceland population have been tested by now. It's free, it's voluntary, you don't have to have symptoms. So they have a very, very good reporting system and as a consequence, they also have a low case fatality rate because they identify um, asymptomatic people early on and, cap and can keep them isolated. Nordics, Norway um, countries are doing well also. Less so in the United States, it was embarrassingly how unprepared uh, the US was. It's catching up but still compared to European countries is way behind, let alone um, Asian countries. So Mexico is embarrassingly low in number of uh, tests performed. And there, therefore the, the magnitude of the epidemic in Mexico is very underestimated. Just compare here per thousand people, um, number of uh, tests performed in Italy, in the US, South Korea, against Mexico. This is the uh, time for duplication of cases. This is an indicator of how rapidly um, the deaths are mounting. So compared to other countries, uh, the time for duplication of uh, deaths is 6.6 um, .6 days. Um, uh, I'm sorry, 5.7, it's the green one, sorry, sorry, 5.7 in Mexico, less than six days. Um, this is the case fatality. Why is it that Italy has such a huge case fatality? It has to do with the aging population. Italy and Japan have the largest proportion of aging population in the world, and in Italy, uh, most of the deaths have occurred in people over 65. Why is it that Mexico has such a high fatality rate? It has to do with the comorbidities, meaning lots of obesity and diabetes in Mexican adults, which are predisposing factors for fatality. How are we doing in vaccines? Some good news I wanted to bring. Um, 86 vaccines are now in trials in China, in the US and in Europe. There are various approaches for recombinant vaccines, for subunit vaccines, for RNA vaccines. One of these will be successful um, sometime in the future. And I hope we will have an effective and safe vaccine 
probably in the next 12 to 18 months. Something about health equity, you have seen in the newspapers, in editorials, the fact that Hispanics and uh, also Afro-Americans are disproportionately affected uh, in terms of number of cases, but also and particularly in number of deaths. Why is that? Well, Black and Hispanics have social determinants, housing crowding, um, poverty, um, and then the comorbidities, hypertension, diabetes, obesity, that make them more susceptible to a severe um, disease or even death. So this is an issue of health equity that we need to pay more attention to. When and how we'll be back to the kind of life that we aspire to? Well, I'm sorry, but we need to first ensure that transmission will be low in terms of number of cases, hospital admissions. We need to have serological tests so that we have less than hopefully um, one, um, and uh, not only serological uh, tests, but also um, case detection and uh, contact tracing in place very aggressively. Um, testing should be free and made available on demand eventually. Um, I already talked to aggressive contact tracing, uh, of course, having all of the um, supplies in hospitals, having our doctors and nurses well protected with PPEs, uh, personal protection equipments. And then we need to be ready that this is going to be an intermittent um, thing where we will need to go back to confinement. There is going to be a second wave in the fall. So how to open the economy, where to open the economy is something that will require uh, very evidence-based information um, to go uh, forward. So I will just finish with a little humor. This is the Marquise of uh, a double future in the, mo in the movies coming, the death of the coronavirus plus the end of the current president. So I'll stop here and turn it over to you. Thank you, Jaime. A wonderful presentation. You, you, you cover all, uh, a, a, a lot. Thank you. Uh, Stefano, would you like to make a comment, please? Sure, Rafael. Um, thank you very much. I um, will just share my screen. Um, I want to make just a quick comment. Um, I appreciate um, Jaime's last slide because it's my local movie theater. And, um, <laughs> and uh, it reflects the, uh, the views of much of the East Bay. So uh, that's the same slide, and I just want to show th this slide. You know, Jaime mentioned at the in his last slide about the way forward, what we need to do to get back to life the way we would like it to be. Now, we have a situation where we didn't learn from history. Um, I think that one of the ironically tragic things for the United States and for Mexico is that we were spared the SARS epidemic. Because if you look at what's happened globally, the best predictor of the countries that managed to quickly control the COVID uh, pandemic are those that had previous experience with SARS. And um, so you see a rapid response in China. I mean, imagine if Beijing and Shanghai and so many other cities in China had gone the way of New York, um, but they didn't because China acted very aggressively to shut down the epidemic in Wuhan. South Korea, um, Seoul, South Korea is larger than New York. Um, they had a blip if you compare it to the epidemic in the United States. If you think about it, South Korea has about 250 deaths from COVID. They're one sixth the size of the US. I mean, just imagine what the US would look like if we had been able to respond like South Korea did. So we, we didn't, we didn't learn the lessons of SARS. We didn't act um, decisively and Mexico essentially um, followed the U.S.'s path. Um, it didn't ramp up testing. It didn't effectively isolate um, uh, people with the infection. It didn't effectively do contract tracing and quarantining. So the question is, what's the way forward? Now, the, yesterday, the Institute for Health Metrics and, Evalu and Evaluation 
uh, released some new models. Their suggestion is that to be able to do the South Korea approach where you aggressively identify new cases and their contacts and separate them from society so that you don't have the need to maintain such dramatic restrictions um, on the entire society, that we need to get down to a level of cases that is about one per million population. So you can see on this graph that Thailand and South Korea are well below that. And um, you can see that Spain, the United States, Italy are closer to 100 times that. And these countries up at the top here are, have flattened the curve, certainly, but they're not rapidly coming down. They're certainly not rapidly approaching the one level. You can see here that Mexico, of the countries I've selected here, is the one that continues to trend up. So it's approaching 10 um, rather than approaching one. And that's uh, obviously a, a great concern. Now, there, there is an alternative to the South Korea approach. And that's more like what Jaime was suggesting um, at the end, in which some combination of isolation, identification, contact tracing, along with continued social distancing and waves of increasing and decreasing social distancing. So I think that both Mexico and the United States are gonna to have to figure out, do they really want to shut this epidemic down and get it down to a level down here somewhere and then be able to relax most of social distancing because we're gonna have the ability to control the many outbreaks that will happen from imported cases? Or are we going to be in a situation where we're willing to accept an ongoing epidemic, not so much that it overwhelms the hospitals, but such that we will continue to have lots of disease and death until a vaccine or uh, drugs are identified. Now, I suppose that the only thing I'm a little bit more pessimistic about than Jaime was is the timeline for a vaccine. I hope he's right, and he might be right, and Tony Fauci um, agrees with him that it's possible, but we've had lots of coronaviruses before, and we've never made a coronav coronavirus vaccine. And uh, many people, would like us to have had a coronavirus vaccine against the coronaviruses that cause the common cold because none of us like colds and many of us would pay for that vaccine. But um, we don't have a SARS vaccine, we don't have a MERS vaccine, and we don't have a vaccine against the coronaviruses that cause the cold. So I'm always, and I'm a veteran of the HIV wars, so I remember when the Secretary of Health and Human Services and Bob Gallo stood up and said that we would, within um, uh, you know, a couple of years at most, we'd have an HIV vaccine, and that was in the late 80s, and of course, we still don't have one. So I'm hopeful, like Jaime is, but I'm not confident that we will get there with a vaccine. But the other thing, if we think about HIV, is that we've come a long way since the late 80s with respect to drugs to treat viral infections. We didn't used to have those. The first one was acyclovir that could treat herpes, genital or, or labial herpes. Um, and now, of course, we can give an almost normal life to people with HIV infection because we've made such great progress with uh, treatment of viral diseases. So I'm, I'm um, very hopeful that we will find effective drugs against uh, COVID. And the other thing that I think is hopeful in that regard is that in the past, in fact, all the way back to the Spanish flu, people realized that they could use plasma, meaning the part of your blood that is the liquid part, not the red blood cell and white cell part, but they could use the plasma from people who'd previously been infected and use that to treat people or protect people who um, were at risk of infection or who had early infection because the antibodies um, that the person who's been infected transfer to the new person. Now we're just starting clinical trials with that in COVID, but I'm optimistic because it has been used successfully with SARS, other um, coronavirus infections in the past. I'm optimistic that that may be very helpful. And if we can not only do that, but actually identify the specific antibodies that work well, then we can manufacture monoclonal antibodies and use those both to protect people who are at great risk, like my mother at 89, and also to treat people early on in their infection. And with that, um, I'll wrap up and um, stop my screen share and give it back to you, Rafael. Thank you, thank you, Stefano. Uh, now we'll go to the political part and to, uh, and to try to understand the Mexican economic response. I will say that COVID-19 will divide world leaders in two categories. On the one hand, you have those who have uh, reacted uh, uh, fast and, uh, and they were able to understand uh, the potential of the pandemic early on. And those, as Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, as Donald Trump, as Jair Bolsonaro from Brazil, that they've been slow and somewhat nationalistic in their response. Miridiana Rios, 
Could you give us, could you give us a sense of what, what has been the response to try to, uh, to help the Mexican economy in this uh, emergency? And why so Andres Manuel López Obrador has been unable really to come up with a, with a strong economic response? Thank you for joining us, Viridiana. Thank you, Rafael. Uh, yeah, well, um, I'm going to divide my talk in two sections. So first, I want to talk to you about the economic emergency plan, what is actually being done and what is not being done. And then I want to talk about precisely what you asked, Rafael, which is why are we seeing this reaction from the Mexican government and not a more generous economic program that could actually help most of the population. So let, let me start with what I call describing what I call as the, the plan there is no plan uh, of the Mexican government. The economic plan there is no plan of the Mexican government. So what's the Mexican government doing? They are doing basically two things. They are doing austerity and they are providing microcredits. So they are, the logic is that they are going to reduce uh, expenditure in some areas of the, of the government in order to increase the number of microcredits that they can provide to small businesses. So how is this austerity being implemented? Well, a um, couple things. One is they are basically shutting down half of the government. Mexico has 10 different ministries, sorry, 19 different ministries. They are gonna close nine of them uh, until January of 2011. Most of the people working inside these ministries are gonna go home, they are gonna keep being paid, uh, but all of the operations of half of the Mexican government are going to basically be shut down. The second one is they are also going to shut down a, a large amount of government programs. Basically, the only ones that are going to keep in place are those programs that President of uh, Mexican President Lopez Obrador promised during his campaign in 2018. The third one is that they are going to reduce the salaries of what they call the elite bureaucracy. I call it the elite bureaucracy, quote unquote, because um, this is not an elite bureaucracy, but most of them belong to the middle class. Salaries are going to be go down, go down in between 25 and 50 percent. Um, how much money these bureaucrats make? Well, uh, cuts are going to start on everybody that earns more than $12,000 per year, right? So this is not wealthy people. This is not the elite bureaucracy. It's just a large cut on government salaries. All of this austerity um, is going to use to do two things. All the money that is saved on this austerity is going to use to do two things. One is to keep the, the Mexican government, whatever is left of the Mexican government, working. Uh, and the second one is to increase the number of microcredits. About the first one, why do they need to keep the Mexican government going? Well, as you know, uh, oil prices have basically um, gone to zero uh, over the last weeks. So that means that even to just keep the regular government exp expenditures of Mexico, they would need to get money from other sources. Mexico is still a government that heavily depends on oil to uh, pay for their expenses. So let me move into microcredits. What are these microcredits about? Well, it's a, it's a program of giving 3 million credits of $1,000 to um, businesses that are either formal or informal. So it's 3 million businesses that are going to be benefit. Uh, there is a pretty significant interest rate. The interest rate is 6%, uh, which is significant for most business. Um, and, this, and, and these credits are going to supposedly start being given um, this week and until they are basically um, completely delivered. Now, um, what is the Mexican government not doing? I, I wish I could see your faces because after I was preparing for this talk, I was like, oh my God, this is just a plan like the, F, the IMF would, you know, would uh, request in the 80s. And, and, and that's, a, that's pretty much it, right? It's a very heavy austerity plan. So what is the Mexican government not doing? So they are not giving cash transfers to the poor. They say they are doing that, but in reality, there is no 
more cash transfers than regular. Regularly, the Mexican government gives cash transfers to 22 million people. Uh, that's exactly the same number of people that are gonna get trans cash transfers during the coronavirus. To put this number on perspective, um, Mexico has 52 million people that are poor, right? So not even half of the poor population are going to get a cash transfer. The Mexican government is not willing to entertain any form of bailout for large corporations or tax cuts. And they are also not giving any support that is not a credit uh, for informal businesses or for small businesses. The total size of the package, uh, the government says that is 26 billion pesos. In reality, when we look at, you know, the things that they are actually doing, once you consider the uh, diminished in the expenditures that the Mexican government is having because of oil, uh, my calculation is that the total plan is about one point of the GDP of Mexico. That's about $9 billion. So it's a very limited program. So why is the Mexican government, second part of my conversation, why is the Mexican government deciding to solve the crisis on this way? I would say uh, three points. I'm gonna go very fast on each of them, but we can explore them more on the questions. The first one is that uh, President of Mexico, Lopez Obrador, believes that debt, in increasing debt, which would be the only way to increase expenditure for Mexico, would weaken his ability to maneuver politically. Uh, he thinks that debt would leave Mexico submissive and tie hands and tight uh, before the power, uh, in front of the power of international investors and banks. And he has this, uh, actually he has some of experience on this uh, with Pemex. Pemex is the oil company in Mexico. They, it's a very heavily invested corporation. And basically it, it operates as of now, mostly only under the permission of international banks because any important change in policy has to be approved, informally approved, but though by those people that own the bones and the debt of Pemex and the oil company. Second point, he wants to maintain, uh, President Lopez Obrador wants to maintain an image of fiscal responsibility. This is particularly important for him as a left politician to disentangle himself from other um, left politicians that have been quite irresponsible. We have to remember that when AMLO took office, uh, he everybody was comparing him with Maduro and with the things that were happening in Venezuela. He wants to be clear that he's not going to be fiscally irresponsible and he's going to maintain a macroeconomic balance that is stable. And then finally is his own public persona. I wrote a long piece about this on, on El País, the journal in, in Spain, so you can uh, take a look at it. But on a, on a nutshell, basically, he's a candidate that since 20 or 25 years ago, he has always been campaigning against public expenditure that is too high, against debt. Uh, under his logic, debt can only be used to favor millionaires and corporations and ends up being a um, heavy burden uh, for the total population of Mexico, particularly the poorest that are not capable of accessing more social programs. Thank you, Biri. Uh, this is very good, and you were uh, uh, right on time. And I and, uh, and uh, I know that uh, everybody appreciates your your analysis because it is, it's not easy to understand why Andres Manuel López Obrador hasn't been able to to, to react uh, fully in, in this crisis. And I will add to what you say that uh, uh, while Arturo just uh, shows my presentation, I will talk very briefly about the impact on. Mexican relations. But what I want to say Bill, is that uh, for AMLO, I mean, he, since he's someone, he's a very, he's very dom domestic oriented. He, he, he hasn't traveled since he's, he's, he's in, 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 in the presidency. I believe that he, it was very hard for him to get lessons from overseas. And uh, he is, uh, unfortunately, at this conjuncture, when we need someone who could understand uh, 
how the world is affecting Mexico, he's been really unable to understand this as a global pandemic. So let me say, uh, let me take five, six minutes and walk you about, I mean, what is the impact of US-Mexican relations? Next one, Arturo. Uh, you know, it's very telling that Andres Manuel López Obrador and AMLO, they continue to, I mean, I will say they continue to have a honeymoon. Uh, they exchange letters, they talk to each other. Actually, I was very surprised just this January, this, this last Monday, Andres Manuel López Obrador said, I want to come to Washington in June to pay my respects to Donald Trump uh, and to thank him personally. They haven't met uh, in person. Uh, AMLO has no travel overseas in his presidency, and uh, but it was very telling that he wants to come uh, to pay his respects to Donald Trump. And basically last week they were talking on the phone and Donald Trump offered Mexico 1,000 ventilators. So yes, that's important. So the question here, does it matter that the two presidents have a good relationship, a personal relationship? I would say yes and no. Yes, and the, the next one, Arturo, because thanks to that, I mean, off, it offers some opportunity and yes, Mexico was able to renegotiate successfully uh, NAFTA. So the US MCA is supposed to be implemented next July 1st. I know that our embassies are working very hard to make this happen. Won't be easy, but they're trying hard. And this will be certainly very good for North America and especially for Mexico. Then I will say there's a very important thing happening here. The Chinese exports to the US in the last uh, two years, they down about 20%. So it's for the Mexican uh, exports to really to fill this back, vacuum. Uh, and and COVID-19 is, is furthering, uh, affecting US-China relations. So, so then there's an opportunity for Mexico. Next one or two. Uh, this is, this is hitting us very bad in terms of remittances. Uh, remittances has become the single most important source, uh, source of, of, of foreign uh, uh, resources and uh, foreign reserves. And last year, we hit a record, record of about $36 billion were sent to Mexico. This is very important for Mexico. It's 3% of our GDP. But let's face it, uh, I mean, Mexico will suffer, but places like Honduras, uh, tiny Honduras, uh, it's 20%, remittances uh, represent 20% of GDP of Honduras. My argument here, and it's very clear, I don't think that we're going to see this level of remittances in the, in the next 10 years. Seems to me that we're seeing the historical peaks last year, and I don't see this level of remittances ever, ever. Uh, next one or two. Uh, tourism has been badly heated in Mexico. Uh, it accounts for eight for five, eight for five, five percent of GDP, uh, and American tourists. It's uh, uh, a very important portion of of tourist visit in Mexico. This has become. It's very sad to see all these beach towns in Mexico. And just this year, the spring breakers coming to Mexico, the, the reduction was close to, I mean, uh, more than 40%. This is very telling. And you, could, you can see the entire Yucatan Peninsula almost shut down. There's big problems in, in, in small hotels. 70% of Mexican hotels, they, they, they small ones, and they really having a hard time uh, to uh, just endure this crisis. Next one or two. Immigration. Here is there's not a here there's not a honeymoon between AMLO and Lopez or uh, AMLO and Trump. They basically do not talk about immigration issues. Uh, although Mexico has been very helpful to the U.S. because through this agreement, uh, migration protection protocols, 62,000 asylum seekers from Central America has been sent back to Mexican border cities to wait there. So. I will say here is an area in which Trump is basically seen November 3rd. He's thinking about the election. He's campaigning every single day. And, uh, and I will say the announce just uh, this past Monday that he will, the, the executive order that he will suspend for 60 days green cards uh, with some exceptions. I hope this is going to be mine because I 
I'm just waiting for my green card, and I hope that I will continue to be teaching at, at, at GPS. But this is very telling in an area in which Donald Trump, regardless of the pandemic, regardless of the suffering of the US, he continues to implement his campaign promises. And, and I will say, and I will finish with this, uh, he's made truly, an I mean, COVID-19 is an excuse for him to completely seal the border, especially to asylum seekers. And obviously, and if you could show the next one, Arturo, uh, well, deportations continue and COVID-19 spread. What you're seeing in, in, in your left hand, that is a place by the name Desayunador del Padre Chava. This is in Tijuana. Every single day, 1,500 people come there to have breakfast. They try very hard. Lately, it's very difficult to feed all of them, most of them migrants who have been deported back to Mexico, Mexicans and Central Americans, because most of, 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 of the voluntary work and, and most of the, of the food was coming from California. Now, we, we who live in California, we cannot go down to Tijuana, so they having a very hard time. Let me stop here and go to this q and I will, uh, uh, I see quite a few questions here. And uh, Stefano, you've been looking at the questions. Uh, could you help, I mean, would you and Jaime will answer some of the questions that you already read in, in the Q&A? Um, yes, and I'm, I've been answering the ones that I can um, uh, written, so people can also look in the answered questions. Um, uh, there are a few there for Jaime specifically. Um, and Jaime, I don't know if maybe you want to take uh, the question on the relationship between testing and the ability to control the epidemic um, uh, that uh, is being asked comparing South Korea and Mexico. Do you want to address that? And I can pile on if you'd like. Yes, um, there's a very, very strong correlation between the number of tests and how effectively the epidemic can be controlled. Um, South Korea is just one example, but there are many others from uh, Vietnam, Taiwan, um, in Southeast Asia, and also in Europe, in, in the case of um, Iceland and now Germany. So by doing very many tests, they can identify early on who is infected and therefore they can put in place a contact tracing um, process to isolate people and break the chains of transmission. That is the only way you can break the chains of transmission. So the correlation between number of tests and effectiveness in curbing the epidemic is very, very high. And yes, I do believe that until Mexico does far more, 10 times more, 20 times more testing, um, it will be until then that a more effective public health approach will uh, succeed. And I, I would um, just add to that, that one of the things that has been very successful in other countries is that when somebody is symptomatic, they're immediately tested. If they're positive, they're not sent home to, to initiate additional chains of transmissions within their household. They're isolated away from their families. So what we've done in this country in absence of testing is to say that if you're not sick enough to go to the hospital, just stay home. Don't worry about being tested. We didn't have enough tests. And therefore that sets up additional chains of transmission within the household. And of course, in many of those households, there are some essential workers who have to go in and out of the household. And so that can provoke, of course, additional chains of transmission. So, um, you know, testing is essential to be able to implement the kind of strategies that have been successful in other countries. So um, I, I, uh, I think there's quite a few other questions. Uh, one question, one more for Jaime is, a question from Beryl Flom asking, is there anything being done to separate people in migrant shelters and to provide food for them? And I know you've been working um, with the shelters at the border, so maybe you have a comment on that. Thank you. Um, yes, um, actually, Rafael and I have been visiting shelters in the border, and uh, we have seen that both in detention centers and in uh, refugee camps, um, there is um, a level of uh, 
crowding that is very concerning. I was able to see um, chicken pox in practically every single camp I visited, both in Chiapas and also at the uh, US-Mexico border. So um, to my knowledge, there has been done nothing to effectively help migrants in terms of uh, food, in terms of better sheltering, in terms of uh, hygienic, hygienic uh, measures. With that crowding and with that lack of soap and water, um, the um, perfect storm for a major uh, transmission. In San Francisco, homeless are being placed in hotel rooms. There's a, a huge capacity for hotel rooms. So I wonder if that is a policy that could be applied in Mexico now that there are so many empty hotel rooms to help uh, migrants that are living in awful conditions to have uh, better sheltering. If I could add to that, I would say uh, that there's, uh, I mean, the situation in the US-Mexico border, especially the Mexican side of the border is very uneven. In Tijuana, I would say civil society, I mean, it's very strong uh, and they have uh, very good shelters and the shelters, they decided early on, like a month ago, to, to close down at, at middle capacity. For example, Casa Migrante, which is the oldest shelter ever in Mexico 32 years ago. This is the first time in 32 years that they closed at half capacity. So they decided we will only keep here 52 people. But in some places like Matamoros, for example, there's a camp that is the east side of the US-Mexico border. There's a camp with more than 2,000 people, and of course, we're getting a lot of spread there. So this is very uneven. This is a very difficult situation. And unfortunately, when the U.S. decided uh, to shut down the border, that was March 20th, at that time, there were 17,000 cases in the U.S., only 200 200 cases in, in Central America and Mexico. So basically, the, the spread was coming from north to south, but now, when there's going to be some spread in Tijuana, and uh, it might be that this will reinforce the ceiling of the border. So this, this might badly affect our region. There's a question there about why Governor Bonilla, if you allow me, uh, Stefan, and then I will give the floor to Viridiana Rios, why Governor Bonilla from Baja California decided to criticize the, the federal government because he said that they were late reporting the, the COVID cases. Well, I believe that he knows, he has realized that there's going to be a lot of suffering in Baja California, in Tijuana, in Mexicali, and he was just to share the blame uh, with the federal authorities. I mean, that's my explanation. I mean, he's worried. He knows that, it's, uh, that COVID is badly affecting Tijuana, badly affecting his state. And it's not only about, uh, uh, about uh, getting sick, but it's about hunger. Uh, that is, to me, the single most important threat in Baja California, that people will become hungry. If there's hungry people in the U.S., if there's so many food banks in the U.S., and, and you have said that, Stefano, I believe that that could be the single most important problem there. Uh, Biri, there were quite a few questions for you. Could you, would you like to answer some of them? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, so uh, most of them, I would say, um, concentrate on asking first, uh, what is AMLO doing for businesses? And second, whether this is going to work. So on the first one, I would say AMLO is doing very little. Actually, he's doing mostly nothing, just the microcredits that I talk about. Is he going to change this on, on the longer term or on the medium term? Maybe. Uh, it's extremely unsure whether he, he may. Uh, this would be about the time for him to do it, and we, we're not seeing any change on the strategy. Is this going to work? I don't think so. Uh, only providing cash transfers to less than half of the poor population and not supporting business is going to hit Mexico very hard. Some studies by SEI, Centro de Estudios Espinosa Iglesias, are saying that the number of poor people may increase on 20 million. So for a country with 52 million, an increase on 20 million would be a drastic increase. 
So um, we're actually very worried. I think this is an ideological position of uh, President Lopez Obrador and, and, and it's unclear whether he may change it. Yesterday, uh, if, my, if I may add, uh, we had a, a, a very important opportunity uh, 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 because uh, U.S. Next, our center, we, we had a webinar with the deputados, with the representative, federal representatives from the party of Morena, the party in power, more than half of <coughs> the time into our, into our webinar. So we we'll talked to them about the economic situation in Mexico, about uh, especially lessons from Central America, Latin America. And I will, and I will say that they were uh, very interested in, in trying to understand. Uh, I believe that the, the, the Morena, the, the party in power, it is divided. Some of them are behind Lopez Obrador, but the other half, Biri, and I don't know what is your take on this, they, they really thinking that, the, that Mexico should have a, 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 a more pronounced intervention, both in, in healthcare and uh, on the economy, because, I mean, I mean they, they looking at what's happening in the rest of the world. It's been, for example, very sad what we have seen in Ecuador, in Guayaquil, people dying in the streets. And uh, so I believe that, uh, that there's a, a good, portion of the Mexican population of the political class, they becoming aware. And unfortunately, the clock is ticking because Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador will have, I would say, another 10 days or so to do something meaningful uh, for the economic recovery. Otherwise, the suffering is going to be very, very harsh. Uh, Estefano Jaime, uh, what, there's plenty of questions there. We have another eight minutes or so. Would you like to, to take another two questions, Estefano and Jaime? And then we'll come back to, to Biri. Um, there's been, um, I, I'm just going through the questions now. Um, so one of the questions from uh, Magdalena Caral is why has Mexico been so reluctant to do testing? Is it the cost? Jaime, do you want to ad address that? Um, that might be one of the reasons um, indeed. Um, I believe um, wholesale cost per PCR are about $15. So it's not a small um, amount for a, a relatively poor country. But um, we have seen other countries in Latin America doing far more testing than, than Mexico. So cost, I think, is an impediment. But I also think that it is relying on a model that is supposed to be random sampling. It is not random sampling. It is not. The probability of selection is not known. So it's not random. Um, we use sentinel studies um, in when I was uh, under secretary and director of epidemiology for influenza. And those work as long as you have testing in place. If you don't have testing in place in the sentinel sites, and if people do not come to be tested, uh, then um, the uh, system of sentinel surveillance doesn't work as well. Um, so to do serological testing, which is probably the next step, we would need to have a test that is uh, highly sensitive and of course specific. The ones that are now in the market are giving false uh, negatives. So it is not reliable yet to use serological tests, but I hope that in about uh, a month from now, we will have saliva tests that you can perform at home send them by mail, and therefore uh, lower the risk of going to a hospital or a clinic to have a nasal swab where you can get exposed, where you can expose health workers. So I'm confident that uh, saliva tests might be cheaper and performed at home, but that might have been so far an impediment to have more testing in Mexico. And I'll also just mention that I think that we have seen here a global failure of the um, of the global systems. So, you know, what you saw in South Korea was that after the epidemic was discovered in Wuhan, the government sat down with local test producers to um, pressure them uh, or collaborate with them to rapidly scale up production of uh, effective tests. That didn't happen globally. So what you, you know, I, I, I think what you saw was many different actors in Mexico trying to negotiate with different global producers, um, bidding wars with richer countries, 
Um, many, many companies not having the supply, even if they weren't unfairly jacking up the prices, they just couldn't meet the supply. You had San Francisco, which couldn't do testing because it didn't have enough swabs. You had other places that couldn't do testing because they didn't have the reagents to extract the RNA, so they could do the testing from the samples. All kinds of really unfortunate supply chain problems that in a, in a, in a more perfect world, and hopefully for the next pandemic, we'll have a global system that enables a response like South Korea, but at a global level. Viridiana, there's uh, some estimates that the Mexican economy could uh, shrunk uh, even 10%. Uh, what would be the likely political consequences from AMLO if that were, if that were to happen? It's a great question. So estimates, the last estimate I saw yesterday from Citibank was a fall of 11%. Uh, to put this in perspective, during the crisis, the financial crisis of 2008 and 2009, it was 7%. So they would be almost double. Um, I'm not sure how this may affect AMLO. I'm sure that this is going to reduce his popularity. It has already done it. Actually, for the first time in the last two years, AMLO has more people disagreeing with the way that he's conducting the government than agreeing with him. That's a huge change from a president that used to have approval rates of 70, 80 percent. Uh, but the problem is that the opposition parties are not necessarily organized or have a sufficiently charismatic candidate to battle Morena and Lopez Obrador. We have to remember that at the end of the day, Morena is a large grassroots movement that represents people that are against the political class and the political institutions and the establishment as we know it. So um, as long as the opposition keeps representing the establishment, I'm not sure that people are going to find a way to punish AMLO that is going to be sufficiently effective. Thank you, Viridiana. I will give a, a last word to each one of, of you, uh, Stefano, uh, Jaime, and, uh, and, I will, uh, and then I would like to close uh, before I give the floor to, to Wendy. Uh, go ahead, Jaime. <laughs> okay, well, um, I, I hope we leave this uh, conversation with a more optimistic uh, view. Um, science is uh, progressing very rapidly. Um, we do have uh, that within a week the virus was isolated, it was uh, sequenced and a, a test uh, developed. So there are 86 vaccine trials, there are many clinical trials in medicines as well. So I'm hopeful that uh, we will have something in, in the next uh, few months that will help in reducing the curve. And I also hope, Rafael, that uh, the world learns this lesson. Uh, this pandemic took us completely unprepared, and I hope that since there will be new pandemics coming, that we have a different uh, attitude to science and more support and the social norms that will change, including handshaking. Uh, so it will be a different world. Stefano. I uh, agree with Jaime. I, I am optimistic, and I would just say since he talked about the biological optimism, I'll say something about the social optimism. Rosa Vivian Fernandez just uh, messaged me separately from the Q&A. She runs a, a federally qualified health center in the Salinas Valley. And her comment was, uh, maybe not at the border uh, migrant shelters, but at migrant encampments throughout California, there is lots of grassroots roots responses that are working from migrant health centers and administrators and contractors to, to help support people who are living in a situation that is potentially dangerous. If you have people in, in dormitory style accommodations who are migrant farm workers, then the accommodations may be more dangerous than the job. And um, so I think that what we are seeing is an extraordinary um, mobilization of civil society. And I think that that may, uh, as Jaime says, be something that endures uh, beyond um, uh, the epidemic. I also think that we will never work again and we will never teach again the same way as we taught before um, as a result of this experience. This will, this will change the world. Thank you. Thank you, Stefano. On behalf of the Center of U.S. Mexican Stories, let me tell you that I believe that Mexico and the U.S. are intertwined in the good times and in the bad times. So that's why this, our center has put together this series of webinars every single Friday at 9 o'clock, Standard Pacific Time. That's our 
contribution to strengthen the, la the dialogue between scientists and professors in both sides of the border. Uh, Wendy, thank you for the opportunity. Back to you. And thank you, uh, panelists, and thank you, everybody, for being here.